Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We can get started. Uh, my name is Jie Huang. I am a senior associate at Scott Legal PC. Today, we are going to spend some time talking about the visa options available for individuals with extraordinary ability in their fields. So just a few things before we get started. Scott Legal is a full-service immigration law firm, which means we do have expertise handling a wide variety of non-immigrant and immigrant visa categories suited for various circumstances. So whatever your immigration needs may be, be it a family-based, employment-based, or investment-based immigration matter, we can help you find a solution. We will be continuing this webinar series. We are doing at least two webinars a month on different immigration law topics. At the end of this webinar, we will be sending out a few things to all participants. First, we will send you a copy of the PowerPoint that will be used in this webinar. Uh, second, we will also send you all a visa guide, um, a PDF document, which is a comprehensive guide to the visa categories that we will be discussing about today that you can use as a reference. Uh, we will also send you a link to where you can sign up for additional webinars coming up in the future on a variety of different topics. And also, we will send you a link to this webinar as it will be recorded. This webinar will also be made available on YouTube, and we do encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we do regularly upload uh, helpful immigration law related videos. Uh, finally, we will send you a link that you can follow to set up a consultation with one of our um, experienced attorneys should you wish to discuss your case further. All right, so today we are very lucky to have Kelly Wiener, who is the managing attorney of the firm, with a wealth of experience handling cases in the visa categories we will be speaking about today uh, for individuals with extraordinary abilities. Um, and Kelly will be presenting about the various options available to extraordinary ability individuals and the requirements and considerations. Finally, for any questions you may have, please feel free to add them to the chat box or use the Q&A function, and we will try and get to all questions. So without further delay, I will turn it over to Kelly. Thank you, GA. Perfect. So we're going to discuss a few different categories today, um, but we're going to get started just talking about an overview of some of the most well-known categories for extraordinary ability. So these are um, the O1A, the O1B, and the EB1A. Uh, so the, the O1A and O1B are uh, non-immigrant visas. Um, so these are visas that are available to for O1A, um, people with extraordinary ability in the sciences, education, business, or athletics. And the standard is someone who has risen to the very top of the field um, in their profession, in their area of extraordinary ability. So quite a high standard. Um, for the O1B, this is for um, it has some subcategories within it, um, but basically it's arts, um, you know, so people with extraordinary ability in the arts, and then there's kind of subcategories for motion picture and TV. Um, so for the arts, there's a slightly lower standard for O1B than for O1A. Um, so the person has to have achieved distinction in their field. So this is a high level of achievement um, as evidenced by a degree of skill and recognition substantially above that ordinarily encountered. Um, so the person would want to show their prominent, their leading, they're well known in their field, but it is a lower standard to meet that standard of distinction as opposed to having to show you've risen to the very top of your field. So if you're in a um, in a field, in a profession or a category where there's not really a clear distinction, like maybe it could be business, maybe it could be arts, if you do have that opportunity, sometimes it can be better to try to um, strategically do an O1B application, um, just given that that standard is a bit easier to meet. Uh, for the motion picture and television industry, um, there's a slightly higher standard, um, and you know you have to be prepared to show a level of acclaim substantially above that of your peers. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the EB1A green card. So this allows you to live and work in the U.S. permanently, and to eventually apply, uh, you know, for um, U.S. citizenship in the future. Uh, so the EB1A, this is for individuals with extraordinary ability in sciences, arts, education, business, or athletics. So, um, you know, O1A and O1B, it's separated arts, business, um, but in EB1A, it's all going to be just under that one, uh, you know, that one category. So for EB1A, um, the standard is 
very high. The, the language really mimics that of the O1A standard. So someone who's risen to the very top of their field um, and has can show sustained national or international acclaim. Um, and then for each of these categories, so for O1A or O1B, they can be granted um, initially for three years. Um, and we'll talk about that in extensions a little bit, a little bit later. Um, and then for EB1A, it's a green card. So you can live and work in the U.S. permanently once it's granted. But for all three, there has to be a showing that you plan to continue working in your area of extraordinary ability. Um, so it's not a situation where you can kind of say, hey, I have this major accomplishment and now I want to come retire in the U.S. That's not what these categories are for. Um, they're either for people who kind of have active you know, work, active itineraries going on in the U.S., um, and perhaps if they want to do that temporarily, the O is a better option, or if they want to stay um, and work in that area and live in the United States as their main place of residence, um, the EB1A would be appropriate for that. Uh, so let's jump to the next slide. And um, I believe GA mentioned this. I think we have a couple questions that have come in, so we will reserve time for questions um, at the end. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the O1A visa. Um, so to, to qualify for this visa, you have to demonstrate either um, that you've received one major internationally recognized award, a Nobel Prize, a Pulitzer Prize, um, you know, or evidence of three of the following criteria that are listed on this on this slide. Um, so, you know, for most people, they're going to be doing, uh, you know, evidence of the three criteria uh, and you, you know, three is the minimum, but you want to do kind of as many as you can. Um, you know, that being said, and we'll talk about this a bit more later, um, it's really about quality of evidence over quantity. Um, so, you know, if you've received, for example, when they say receipt of nationally or internationally recognized prizes or awards. So if you receive, for example, you know, um, like the best student award or highest GPA award at your college, those types of things are generally not helpful, uh, you know, for an O1 or an EB1 application. Um, you know, sim like really what you want to look at, for example, memberships or associations in your field, which require outstanding achievements of their members. So you want to be thinking, uh, you know, is this the type of association where I pay a fee and anybody who, um, you know, works in my industry is allowed to join? Uh, so those types of memberships are really not going to be helpful for these types of applications. You want to be looking for memberships that have kind of a very, you know, stringent criteria for allowing you to enter, um, that require extraordinary, um, you know, achievements of their members, um, you know, where may, perhaps there are other members, um, you know, who are very well known or leading in the industry. Um, those are all very helpful, uh, you know, for, um, you know, for meeting these types of requirements. So even though, you know, you do want to include everything, uh, you know, you want to have a, a good volume of evidence to show you have that extraordinary ability for as many of these criteria as you can, you do not want to be just submitting, um, you know, student awards or anything that kind of would make it seem as though your application, um, you know, doesn't meet the standard of, you know, somebody who's risen to the very top of their field. So let's talk about the O1B. Um, so for this kind of very similar criteria to the O1A, uh, you know, but m much more arts focused, as you would expect. So you either have to have been nominated for or received a significant national or international award or prize, like an Emmy or a Grammy, or evidence of three of the following, you know, that are listed here. And you can see that these are, um, you know, much more arts focused, right? So, um, you know, major commercial or critically acclaimed, acclaimed success in the performing arts, um, you know, as shown by box office receipts or record cassette compact disc or video sales. So some of the uh, language in the regulations are a bit old, um, you know, maybe not uh, as, uh, you know, up to date in terms of what types of evidence they may now accept, but there have been helpful updates in the USCIS, you know, policy manual guidance um, to help officers understand, you know, what is going to show, you know, extraordinary ability or distinction within the arts. Um, so again, similar to O1A, you're going to want to show as many of these as you can, but at least three. And you're going to want to be considering not only, you know, does this show that I, uh, you know, meet the plain language, you know, that I had a lead role in a, you know, in a production, um, but also, you know, was it a production or event that has a distinguished reputation? What do the reviews say? You know, where was this? How many people saw it? Um, you know, where does it rank in in the industry generally in terms of importance or prestige? And those are all important questions to ask as you gather your evidence. 
So what is the difference between O1A and O1B? We've, we've talked a little bit about some of the differences, um, and here we have a helpful chart to just highlight them for you. Um, you know, so O1A, we know the fields are science, education, business, or athletics. O1B, arts, motion picture, or television industry. The standards are slightly different. So, you know, higher standard for O1A, small percentage who's risen to the very top of their field. And then for the arts and motion picture, they each have their own standard, um, you know, and the distinction standard for arts, which is, you know, slightly, uh, you know, easier to meet than the O1A standard. Um, when we look at how long, those are the same um, across, uh, you know, both visas. So you can get an initial visa for three years, and then you can do an extension for one year. We have extensions for one to three years. We say that here because if you have, um, you know, gotten an O1 and you're just finishing up a set of projects or a set of, uh, you know, shows or a play, uh, and you need more time for that, then the longest your extension could be granted is one year. However, if you are starting a new set of projects, a new set of tour dates, a new set of, um, you know, theatrical, you know, productions, or working for a company in your area of, of extraordinary ability, and they have a new contract for you, then you can potentially get, um, you know, another three years in O in O status. Um, so, it's uh, you know worth asking for that additional three years, depending on you know what the the terms of employment are, or you know if you have work uh, you know lined up for three years at that point. Um, so, can your family come to the U.S.? The answer is yes. You can bring your uh, your spouse and any unmarried children under twenty one. Uh, your children can attend school. Uh, as can your spouse. Unfortunately, um, the spouse, neither your spouse nor your children, are allowed to work in the United States based on the dependent O visa. All right, let's talk a little bit about the EB1A green card. So in terms of the plain language of the requirements, they are very similar to O1A and O1B, um, you know, either receipt of a major internationally recognized award or you meet three out of the 10 criteria. Um, the criteria are kind of mixed to include both the arts and science business athletics. Um, and on this slide, we want to talk about the Kazarian analysis. So this is where when the government is looking at a petition, they will use this two-step analysis to consider whether you meet the standard, um, you know, to qualify for the O or for the EB1A. So uh, the way that this works is first, let's say you've won an award, um, you know, a, a nationally you know, recognized award. They'll look first, okay, great, you have an award, you've met the language of the criteria, but then they'll at the, they consider the quality of the evidence. So in totality, when they look at their final determination, are you among this very small percentage of people who've risen to the very top of your field of expertise? Um, so that's where we, when I was talking earlier about not including weaker evidence, you know, the reason to not include that is let's say you have, you know, three very strong awards, um, you know, that show that you really have you know, made a lot of, um, you know, uh, you know, or had a lot of success in your industry, that these are awards where very, you know, prestigious people are on the, the judging panel where, um, you know, to win this award means something very significant in your industry. Um, and then you include, you know, seven student awards or weaker awards. So that balance is not going to go in your favor. It, it's a good idea um, at that point, you know, to to say, okay, um, better to rely on three very strong awards and then build up the other parts of the application, um, perhaps include, you know, try to include more than just three criteria, as opposed to including all that weak evidence. And that the reason is this Kazarian analysis. And this does apply for O's, and it also applies um, for the EB1A. Um, so it's something to consider. Uh, when you're putting together your evidence that you do want to include, you know, a significant volume of evidence. Oftentimes these petitions are very, very long, hundreds, hundreds of pages. Uh, however, you don't want to be including evidence that's going to weaken that totality determination. It's going to weaken when they look at your profile. Um, they want, you want their main takeaway to be that you are someone who's risen to the very top of your field. Um, and uh, for the EB1A, even though the language um, of the you know regulatory criteria or the requirements are is very similar to the O. You also need to consider this is a green card. This is going to allow you to be in the United States permanently to eventually become a U.S. citizen. So the standard is much higher. So just because you've obtained an O1A or an O1B, it does not mean you will absolutely qualify for an EB1A. You might, 
uh, you know, but you may not. Um, so it may be a situation where perhaps if you are interested in a green card, you continue to work, you know, if you're on the O1A or O1B, ideally you'll already, you'll already be working in your field of expertise. Um, and so definitely something you want to continue to build up um, if the EB1A is your goal. I think we, we definitely have clients that come to us and perhaps are maybe in you know beginning stages of their careers, or maybe they've had some success, but are maybe not yet at the EB1A standard. Um, you know, So that can be something where you kind of think strategically about working on some of the criteria for EB, EB1A. Um, perhaps you wouldn't necessarily you know, publish much material about yourself normally or say yes to interviews about the work that you're doing normally, but perhaps you do those things because building that type of, of record is very helpful um, for EB1A. So definitely something that you know, I think can be helpful for, you know, for people to do if they're interested in the screen card is to look at those criteria. And when you're making those career choices is think strategically about what projects you want to be involved in and what evidence you could pull from that to um, help you meet that criteria. So now I'm going to turn it over uh, to GA to talk to us about the National Interest Waiver, which can be another great option for people who, uh, you know, have some extraordinary ability, but maybe you're not yet at that EB1A standard. Yeah, definitely. All right. So let's talk about the National Interest Waiver. So the National Interest Waiver is a subset of the EB2 green card category, employment-based. But the uh, major difference from the traditional EB2 um, category is that you can self-petition for an NIW. You do need to have a proposed endeavor in the United States, but you do not need to have a U.S. petitioner to um, sponsor your petition. So this can be a, a very attractive option for a lot of people. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the requirements on how to qualify for the National Interest Waiver Green Card. So first, um, as with all EB2 category petitions, uh, you do need to meet the EB2 threshold requirement. <clears throat> And you can meet the threshold requirement by two ways. The first is by showing that you have an advanced degree, uh, which is defined as a master's or above, or the equivalent of an advanced degree. So, for example, even if you don't have a master's degree in your field, if you have a bachelor's degree in your field, and after you received your bachelor's degree, you have five or more years of progressive work experience in your field, that can also count as an equivalent of having a master's degree. Now, uh, it is important to note that um, if you have a foreign degree, you do need to have um, a U.S. education equivalency report um, issued by an agency in the United States that confirms that um, the level of the uh, education criteria uh, credentials that you received is equivalent to a U.S. credential. So that's something important to note. Another important thing to note is that five years of work experience um, by meaning progressive, it means your duties must have increased in complexity and seniority as time goes on. Uh, if you if your duties stay the same, your titles stay the same, uh, you may get um, have a little bit of difficulty meeting uh, the requirement to show progressive work experience. Now, uh, the other option on um, the other pathway to meet the EB2 threshold requirement is by showing exceptional ability. And you can show exceptional ability in the sciences, arts, or business um, by showing that you meet uh, three out of seven criteria that is listed here. Uh, this includes um, items such as 10 years of full-time experience in your field, uh, high salary um, compared to others in your field, recognition for your original achievements in your field by peers, industry, government actors, etc., cetera, um, membership in a professional association, having a license, um, et cetera. Now, similar to the Kazarian analysis, two-step Kazarian analysis we talked about, Kelly talked about earlier, uh, we have a lesser degree of two-step analysis in that you, not only do you need to show three out of seven out of these um, evidentiary criteria, but you the totality of the evidence must also show um, that holistically, the profile is that of a person, a professional who has a degree of expertise significantly above ordinarily encountered in the field. However, um, it is important to note that the bar for exceptional ability is uh, definitely lower than the bar that we talk about when we talk about extraordinary ability. So exceptional ability and extraordinary ability are two very different concepts, um, and they require um, different degrees of expertise and, and acclaim and prominence in the field. Now, 
after that you're able to show that you meet the EB2 threshold requirement, um, the next task is to demonstrate that you do qualify for a national interest waiver. And um, the reason why you also need to show this part of the analysis is because, you know, uh, if you qualify for a national interest waiver, you're allowed to self-petition. Um, otherwise, the other uh, option that you have is to have a U.S. employer sponsor you and you need to go through the labor certification. And that can be a lengthy um, and uh, complex process. But if you qualify for a national interest waiver, you are basically given a fast track out of that um, that uh, requirement. So that's why uh, it is very important to show uh, that you meet the requirements for a national interest waiver as well. So what are the requirements? It is a three-pronged test that was promulgated by a landmark case called the Matter of Danisar. Um, and I will go through these three uh, three questions. So first, the first requirement is that you need to prove that your proposed endeavor in the United States has both substantial merit and national importance. Now, what does that mean? So um, a, merit, uh, a meritorious endeavor can be proven in a wide variety of fields, including business, health, education, science, technology, and endeavors such as those that further human knowledge in those key areas, such as medical advances, civil engineering, and also endeavors that um, potentially has a strong positive economic impact to the U.S. economy um, that is uh, favorable to be found to have substantial merit and national importance. What is likely not to uh, qualify as a matter of national importance is if your work in the United States only benefits your immediate clients or only benefits your immediate employers. So in that case, the benefit can be char characterized as local. Now, by contrast, what the government is looking for for you know national interest waiver petitions is endeavors that have a broader impact, a broader potential impact to the industry, technology, U.S. competitiveness, uh, any matter that the U.S. thinks is important, such as you know veterans' welfare or um, environmental sustainability. Those are a few examples. Uh, really, the key question is, what is the future impact of your work and how is that important to United States interests? And what what we do for a lot of clients is that um, we help identify uh, government reports um, issued by U.S. government agencies, identifying some priorities, policy priorities that the government thinks is important. And we would append that. We would include that in the uh, petition package to support why uh, those um, areas of endeavor are important to um, the United States. Now, the second prong, the second requirement is that the applicant must show that they are well positioned to advance the proposed endeavor. And here, the inquiry, the focus is on the individual and the individual's unique knowledge, the individual's unique expertise, know-how, and experience in the field that really make them the best candidate to, um, to you know, do the work that is posing to have a significant impact to the economy and to the society. So what you want to bring in is evidence of your education, relevant education, evidence of your experience in the form of expert letters, employer letters, um, and a record of success in previous related projects. Um, and if you have been mentioned in the media for any of those achievements, you would also want to um, include evidence that you have been recognized for such achievements. Now, the third requirement then is that there must be a showing that on balance, it will be beneficial to the United States to waive the requirements of a job offer and thus of a labor certification for that particular project and that particular individual. And um, there are various ways we can argue this. Um, one type of argument we would rely on prong one, um, the substantial merit and national importance of someone's proposed endeavor, we would really emphasize the broad systemic benefits that such an endeavor could bring, positive impacts to the economy, positive impacts to technological advancement that could bring um, that outweigh the ordinary benefits of the labor certification, which is saving one more job spot for a U.S. worker. We could also rely on prong two and really talk about the unique skills and experiences that somebody brings in their individual experience that cannot easily be replaced by um, uh, another uh, worker in the United States with similar credentials. Um, so we would really uh, talk about the uh, record of success that the person has and the outstanding achievements that they have made in the field that cannot easily be re replicated. 
Um, another uh, thing we can talk about in in terms of um, which is relevant to entrepreneurs is that some entrepreneurial projects uh, really um, pose possibilities on generating a, a high number of jobs in the United States. And that in itself can be a special consideration uh, because really the point of having the labor certification process is to protect the labor job supply for U.S. workers. But if the endeavor of an individual entrepreneur can create dozens of jobs in the process, uh, that can certainly be a positive countervailing consideration to that policy. Uh, so that could um, support the case for granting a national interest waiver uh, for that particular applicant. All right, so we'll move on to the next slide. So what is included in expert opinion letters? So it is important to discuss a little bit about the role of expert opinion letters because uh, they are um, a powerful form of evidence for both O1, um, EB1, and NIW, EB2, NIW petitions, uh, although the purpose of the letters may be a little different for each category. So for the EB1 and O1 petitions, you would want the experts to write letters to confirm that you yourself, uh, well, the beneficiary, right, have extraordinary ability in the field and is well known and that they have sustained national or international acclaim in their fields in the case of uh, O1A and um, a, a high distinction in the field in terms um, in, in cases of the O1B uh, applicant. For the NIW petition, um, we can have letters that support how the petitioner's proposed endeavor in the United States would have national importance and have a broad positive impact in the industry. Um, for example, a letter from a government agency that can confirm that you know, such types of endeavor support governmental priorities, that could be a very uh, positive uh, strengthening factor for an NIW petition. Uh, another type of NIW letters can talk about the applicant themselves' contributions to the field and how well they are well positioned to advance the endeavor. Uh, because as, as I mentioned before, one part of the NIW application is showing how you have the experience and, and the uh, know-how and the right education and skills to really bring your project to life. So for example, we would have letters from previous employers confirming the applicant's leading role in a particular project that resulted in, in a outstanding impact to the field field, um, you know, um, research projects, for example, that received a lot of attention from the public, uh, received um, a lot of attention from the media, the industry uh, more broadly. So those kinds of letters can be very important to support the well-positioned prong. Um, it is important to uh, choose carefully who is writing the letter. And we typically want to have these letters be written by leading experts in the field who have many decades of experience. Typically, uh, we would uh, usually add a full curriculum vitae with the letter so that the USCIS officer, when they're looking at the letter, they can know um, exactly what experience the expert themselves has that qualifies them to really speak on the issue. It, it kind of uh, functions like an expert testimony, really. Um, for the um, both for the O1 EB1 context and NIW um, individuals who hold senior positions in leading institutions or corporations in cases of someone in business, for example, uh, that could also be a powerful uh, form of evidence. Um, for the NIW part uh, particularly, uh, if you get a letter from a government agency, someone who is currently active in the government agency. Um, that could be a particularly favorable factor for um, for strengthening the petition. How does the individual know you? So, so it is recommended to have a mix of independent letters and inner circle experts. So, what is what do I what do I mean by this? By inner circle, I mean people that you have actually worked with in the past, right? And so, those inner circle experts. Um, can speak to your achievements and previous projects that is that is relevant to the work that you propose to do in the United States, and they can really provide the detailed uh, mini, even a mini case study of what you have done. And those kinds of examples can really bring to life um, uh, your particular skills and achievements. So that is a very important type of letter to get. 
Um, independent experts are people who have not directly worked with you before, but they know you through your work or through your reputation in the industry more generally. Uh, and what they can do is they can really confirm that your abilities are outstanding in your field or that your work stands to impact the field in a broad way um, as opposed to just benefiting your direct employer or your direct clients. So the content of the letters, what does the letters uh, need to contain in terms of contents? Um, spe specific detail is quite important uh, to have in the letters. Um, so letters that are mainly just formulaic and just have flowery language, uh, hyperbolic language, and letters that simply just repeat the regulatory requirements are not favored by USCIS and they may not rely on the contents of such letters. Um, for example, you can't just say, oh, applicant is a well-known figure or just say, oh, the applicant's project has national importance because those statements will be, you know, um, considered as conclusory statements. So what is really important is to gather specific examples of your work, um, the beneficiary's work, because those examples will support why the either the beneficiary is an extraordinary figure or why an individual's proposed endeavor project in the United States has national importance. So uh, questions that the expert letters can answer are, you know, things like, what exactly did you do um, in your in your field? What problem or limitation did your project solve? Um, how does your work set you apart from others? Uh, and why was this achievement important in the industry? So really explaining the details that bring those uh, uh, case studies to life is very important to have in, in the expert letters to um, support the case. All right, so we can move on to the next slide. Which category should I apply for? So there are a couple of strategic considerations you may want to consider um, when you're deciding on choosing between those various categories. So the first question is, do you want to stay in the United States temporarily or permanently? Right. So as Kelly mentioned before, the O1A and O1B are um, non-immigrant visas. You can extend them if you have um, if you have additional projects in the United States but uh, this does not give you a permanent ability to live in the United States. Now, the EB1A and NIW are both green card applications. They are green card categories uh, and they are appropriate if your plan is to live and work in the United States permanently. And it is also important to consider that being a permanent resident in the United States also brings responsibilities. For example, filing taxes, that may be one of them. Uh, also, there is a limitation on how much time you can spend outside the United States if you become a permanent resident of the United States, if you want to keep the uh, green card status. So it really depends on uh, what your future plans are, what you are envisioning for um, your life. So another question that you want to consider is, um, do you have a U.S. employer or agent who can act as the petitioner for your um, application, or do you want to self-petition, right? So it is important to note this is because the O-1 is a criteria. Uh, O-1 uh, is a category where you do need a U.S. employer or a U.S. agent. If it is an agent, it needs to be either a U.S. citizen or a U.S. permanent resident. Now, um, it is possible for an individual, if they have a U.S. Com company that they own, so if they have a, um, a U.S.-based corporate entity, that is actually considered a separate individual than the person themselves. So that can also act as a U.S. person to act as the petitioner. So... In other words, the company, the U.S. company of a foreign person is considered a separate entity and can act as the petitioner. Definitely speak to attorney if speak to an attorney if that is uh, one of the options you're considering. Um, by contrast, an EB1A petition or an EB2 NIW petition, an applicant doesn't need any uh, pre-existing ties to the United States to um, pursue the petition. An applicant can be um, living abroad and all, all of the um, connections that they have could be from abroad and still file a self-petition to immigrate to the United States and qualify for an immigrant visa. Now then, the third uh, consideration we want to talk about is 
with family, right? So a very important difference um, between the O1 option and the EB-10IW option is what uh, rights do the family members get? So for the O1, uh, as Kelly mentioned earlier, uh, your spouse and minor children, um, unmarried children under 21, can come to the United States on the O3 dependent visa, um, and your children can study in the United States and, and the spouse. However, uh, the spouse, unfortunately, does not get the um, ability to work in the United States. <clears throat> By contrast, EB1A and the NIW are both green card options. <clears throat> and your spouse and your dependent children can also qualify for green cards as derivative beneficiaries. Um, and if you, you know, um, are already in the United States and you are applying for adjustment of status, uh, what's called an I-485 application within the United States to switch to permanent resident status um, and apply for work and travel authorization as a part of that, um, this the same benefits can, can be claimed by um, your spouse and children as well um, once they also apply for the I-485. So this can be a very attractive option uh, for some people. All right, so... Now then, we will switch gears to a little bit and and really compare um, the different uh, standards that that are uh, applicable um, between a non-immigrant visa and a green card category, right? So, as Kelly mentioned a little earlier, um, the EB1A has a, a very high standard when they when the USCIS is judging applications, even though the uh, regulatory criteria. Um, uses very similar language. Um, in reality, practically, the EB1A is scrutinized quite strictly because, in part because it is a green card, right? So especially if you're jumping from an O1B to an EB1A, right? Uh, which the O1B, which only requires distinction in the field, it can be quite a high jump to um, try and qualify for an EB1A, which requires um, sustained national and international acclaim in your field. So it is important to note that the just the fact that you qualified for an O1A or O1B does not mean you automatically qualify for an EB1A. Uh, definitely uh, speak to an experienced attorney to really um, assess the profile, the strength of your profile. And it may be strategically a good idea to work on bolstering your portfolio and um, focusing on adding certain types of evidence to uh, really boost your profile. For example, uh, even if you uh, normally don't appear on you know, competitions and act as a judge, um, that could be a very good idea if an uh, EB1A is um, in your plans. Uh, if you if you participate in competitions and act as a judge, that can be um, one of the uh, evidences that can be helpful for your application. So uh, looking forward and trying to collect uh, relevant evidence can be a good strategy uh, if you're already in the United States on an O1 and want to move to an EB1. Um, the other issue that I want to talk about is timing, right? So uh, if you have, if you're already in the United States on a non-immigrant status, on a different underlying visa status, um, timing can be an important consideration because some visas are harder to extend um, once you have filed an immigrant petition. So Im immigrant petition uh, means the underlying petition for the EB1A or the EB2 NIW, and it's called the I-140. Um, even if you just file the I-140 portion, uh, you could get some some pushback in some visa categories because for for most uh, for all non-immigrant visa categories except for dual intent visa categories, you always need to show that your intent is not to immigrate to the United States, right? So, for example, if you're on a TN visa, the TN visa is one example of a visa where the non-immigrant intent is judged quite strictly. If you have a record of being having filed an I-140, in some cases, you could get pushback at the border when you're applying for a TN visa again, um, since that, you know, just, just filing the I-140 could, in, in the eyes of some border officers, uh, could mean that you intend to immigrate to the United States. Now, dual intent visas um, 
for that one, uh, they are not affected by uh, this immigrant intent issue, and that includes the H-1B, L-1, and the O-1. Um, just having filed an I-140 shouldn't be a basis for denial for those types, uh, but definitely speak to an attorney if um, if you're planning to uh, apply for an immigrant visa for to really consider the strategy and timing. So the last uh, strategic point that uh, is involved in this decision is family, right? So uh, the EB1A and EB2 NAW, as I mentioned before, are employment-based green cards and allow spouses and children to also obtain green cards as derivative beneficiaries. Um, however, there is an age limit for um, um, for the children. So if if you have children who may um, age out soon, then that could be another strategic reason to uh, go ahead and file the I-140 um, earlier than you may otherwise. All right. So the last topic that we will cover before heading to the Q&As is, are extraordinary ability categories available for entrepreneurs? And the answer is yes. Entrepreneurs can potentially qualify for the O1A, EB1A, and EB2 NIW uh, categories, provided that they are able to present the evidence that is responsive to the eligibility criteria that we uh, laid out in the previous um, slides. So let's um, talk a little bit about the EB1A and NIW. The advantage of those uh, those pathways are that they both allow for self-petitions, meaning that entrepreneurs uh, can apply as an individual uh, without needing to have a job offer or um, a US-based um, entity to act as a petitioner, um, right? So <clears throat> for the O1A, um, it is a little different, um, but one advantage for uh, entrepreneurs is that you are allowed to have ownership interest in the entity that is acting as the petitioner. Um, you do need a U.S. company to act as that petitioner, uh, but having ownership, uh, which is the case for a lot of um, entrepreneurs, uh, will not be an issue. Now, uh, the last thing to mention is that there has been some changes made to the NIW standard under the landmark case matter of Danisar, uh, which did make NIW a much friendlier category for entrepreneurs. Um, for example, uh, the case law recognizes that entrepreneurs uh, frequently cannot um, rely on the traditional labor certification um, pathway because they have ownership interest in their companies. Um, so, so if we have a strong case for entrepreneur, we can talk about those countervailing um, practical difficulties to support uh, the case for an NIW. Uh, another thing to mention is that in 2022, there has been some updates to the USCIS policy manual that um, really adds to the list of the evidence that um, entrepreneurs can use uh, that can be helpful on supporting their case. Uh, for example, entrepreneurs can submit letters from investors, uh, users talking about their uh, particular product and its potential. Uh, entrepreneurs can also rely on their history of hiring, revenue growth, and job creation as part of um, showing how they're well positioned to uh, you know, um, continue their business endeavor. And finally, um, different types of evidence such as participation in incubators, accelerators, and being awarded investments from venture capitalists uh, can also uh, serve as powerful forms of evidence in supporting an NIW case for uh, an entrepreneur. All right, so now we can turn to questions and answers. So I'll answer the first question, is architecture a part of art? So I think this question is asking, do I want to choose the O1A or O1B for architecture? And really my answer to that is it depends, right? So if you uh, position architecture as um, an art so, such that we would use the OMB, um, it would, the focus would really be on the artistic merits of the um the work that the beneficiary is doing. If the architecture uh, is um, positioned as a science, then it would be on the technological parts of architecture. Um, what are your thoughts, Kelly? Yeah, no, fully agree. I think that architecture is one of those, um, uh, you know, 
one of those fields that could potentially, you know, go one way or the other. And it would really depend on kind of the job, um, you know, the job description, is it design focused or not? Um, and also the person's background, like, are we in a situation where we want to, you know, try to go to the O1B because it has a slightly less, um, you know, stringent, uh, you know, criteria. Um, there seem to be some, um, some here is uh, that have, someone shared their email. So if you, you know, if you do want to get in touch with us to have a private consultation and discuss kind of very specific details for your case, um, you can, you know, visit our website. The link is on the PowerPoint um, and you'll also receive an email from us afterwards with several relevant links. So visit our website and, and go ahead and set up a consultation. And we're happy to answer those specific, um, you know, specific types of uh, inquiries about your actual case. Um, so when people are asking a little bit about awards, I worked in a marketing agency that received many awards. Does that count? Um, so I think this person is kind of talking about, you know, sometimes, and um, Jay, I'll for your opinion on this too, sometimes if you're part of a team, um, you know, and and the team gets an award, uh, there can be a question about how to utilize that. So Jay, you want to talk a little bit about how we approach that? Yeah. So um, if it is an award that, that, that you you uh, received as a team, and if there is other evidence in the record that supports your critical role in you know getting that award, then we can potentially use that. Um, either if not as an award, we can also use that under significant contributions or things like that. So they there can be, you know, uh, uh, strategic um, considerations on where we place the evidence. Um, uh, but certainly uh, it is it, it's. It can be used, um, maybe not under if it is if it is uh, something where you worked at an agency and the agency received an award and you were one of the uh, 100, 100, 200 employees of that agency, then obviously uh, that that could not um, that could not be used as your personal award. Uh, but definitely that I would I would say that's a fact specific inquiry. Uh, we would want to look at the award and the circumstances of the award to really determine where to place that piece of evidence. Yeah, and I think that answer is also relevant for this this second comment about having um, an honorable mention uh, in an international architecture competition. So potentially it would just depend on yeah. lots of different things like the parameters of the competition. Uh, is it a very prestigious competition? You know, th things like that. Um, so potentially, yes, uh, but would definitely need to be kind of part of the strategy. Um, I see comments here, kind of, again, very specific comments about someone's particular background. My my suggestion would be definitely make a, um, you know, schedule a consult with us. We're happy to kind of walk through, um, you know, your specific factual situation and talk about, put, you know, whether or not it's a, it's a viable approach. Um, no specific number of letters is required. Uh, I think that, um, you know, the, like, often, you know, submitting maybe like 12 letters is going to be significantly too many. <laughs> Um, you know, you really, again, want to think about the quality of the letter writers, you know, are these people that are really at the top of their field or, you know, is there kind of someone from a, you know, relevant government, um, you know, you know, position, somebody in an agency that's very well thought of or, a, you know, a, a corporation where it's, you know, easily recognized name, things like that you want to consider for for your letters. Um, so How long so, is yeah NIW visa length? Yeah, so um, it's a, a permanent resident visa, right? So once you get the um, I, I don't know if this question is asking about the validity of the visa itself or the you know length of amount of time you're allowed to stay on the NIW. Um, but um, the immigrant visa is sort of like a ticket to the United States, right? So if you uh, go for consular processing and get the immigrant visa stamp, that is usually valid for like six months and you need to enter the United States while it's valid. But once you get into the United States, you get a green card and that's yours for life uh, as long as you um, meet the um, you know um, criteria for maintaining permanent residence. Um, do you think that's what they asked? Yeah, I, I, think, I, so. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> Okay. So, so someone's asking about if you have an approved I-140, um, but the spouse is not in the United States. Um, so yeah, uh, so it is possible for the main applicant to get the adjustment of status and have the spouse do something called follow to join. Um, they can't, it, it's not really possible to do at the same time, unfortunately, because the main applicant has to have their, has to have their green card. Um, you know, so it, it is definitely a much better situation in terms of timing to go together either to the consulate or do an adjustment of status whenever possible. Um, uh, so uh, kind of 
something talking about the NIW will finish soon. It won't be able to apply for this category. Um, so this category is is available. Um, is is you know not is in the regulations is not kind of going away. Um, but the availability of immigrant visas each year, um, we are in a situation where there is a you know substantial backlog. So that I'm not sure if that's um, you know, what you're hearing about, but yes, um, it's, you know, right now the category is not current. So it would mean that um, if you had an I-140 approved, you could not also concurrently file an adjustment of status if you were in the United States, or your case would not immediately be sent to the consulate if you're going to a consulate, uh, because there are not immigrant visas available right away in each category. All right. Um, so GA, do you want to take this this next yeah, one? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah. Can I apply from the United States from any category, come as a tourist and then apply? Um, coming in as a tourist and then applying for an immigrant visa is risky. I think if you want to change status to an O visa, I think um, you can try to do that. Uh, but for any types of changing of status, if you change status soon after you enter the United States, that raises kind of a red flag, right, to um, to USCIS on questioning what your original intent was on um, entering um, to the U.S. as a visitor initially. So that's that's risky. So definitely um, talk to an attorney um, to really parse out the um, considerations there. Uh, when will I receive my work permit after approval for EB1 or EB2 NIW? A work permit by that, I'm not sure if um, you're referring to the EAD, the employment authorization card, uh, after you file the I-45, or if you're talking about the green card itself. Uh, if, if you're talking about the EAD, the EAD is uh, right now it's uh, average on taking several months to get um, issued after you file the EAD application that's connected to your I-485, once you file the I-485. Um, and the green card itself, uh, obviously it takes longer than that, um, can take upwards to around a year to uh, to get an answer on, um, uh, on the green card itself. Okay, national campaigns. I've worked on have received nominations and awards. So I think it really ties into what we discussed previously on, uh, you know, this answer being fact specific on your um, personal involvement with the award. Um, the more significant your involvement with the award, uh, the more possible it is that you will be able to use it as a form of evidence supporting your case. Um, can you apply for EB2 while on B1, B2? So I, I already answered this question. Um, it, it is it is risky, so definitely uh, talk to an attorney before uh, going down that route. Um, where would you place business analysts um, on logistics and supply chain management? What could be the most appropriate visa type to apply for? Um, if you have extraordinary ability in your... Um, area of endeavor in business, uh, I may um, try O1A. Um, NIW could also apply uh, if you have an advanced degree, um, depending on what your proposed endeavor is and um, what your um, experiences are. Well, you could also be an you know EB1A if you if you really uh, are famous uh, and have um, earned a lot of recognition in your fields such that you are at the top of you know business analyst um, active in 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 the world. Yeah, and I think if 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 you're you know if you're someone who's kind of looking for a rundown of potential all potential work visa options, then I'd suggest scheduling a consultation um, to to discuss those details. So NIW visa, uh, it is uh, leading to a green card. So if you are approved for the NIW, you will um, get a green card that will allow you to live and work in the United States permanently. Self-service package. Uh, no, I don't believe we do that. Um, okay. How long does it take to get the NIW visa? How long the process that it takes to get it. Um, if you're if you're asking about the processing times, um, if you use regular processing with USCIS, they take about a year to get a decision to you just on the I-140 portion. Um, if you use pr premium processing, the USCIS will get you a decision or an RFE in 45 calendar days. And um, if it's an RFE, you you will you know respond to the RFE and they will take another 45 calendar days to get back to you. Um, the preparation process, I would say uh, it really varies on, you know, uh, how much uh, the client is able to dedicate time for that. 
Um, I, th I think the fastest we've seen, um, you, you know, being prepared for the case is like we, we've had a case that was prepared and filed in 90 days. Um, but many of my cases take longer than that to prepare. So the document preparatory process actually uh, takes a while because there, there are many things to um, prepare. Uh, okay. So this, I think, is the same question um, that someone oh, okay. had sent earlier about um, being a PhD student. So for this type of question, because it's so specific, we're not able to really provide a response about you qualify for the NIW or you don't. Um, what we would need, what we would recommend, is that you would set up a consultation so we could discuss your educational background, your work, um, you know, all of those things that are relevant to determining whether an NIW is a possibility. Perfect. So I think those are all the, the questions that we have. So thank you to GA. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your great participation. And um, we will send an email with some follow-up information. Thank you. Thank you.